Hello there. So, okay, I know I said I was burnt out on Stefan Molyneux, but the other day I happened to watch Star Wars The Force Awakens again, and I couldn't resist going to take another look at Stefan's video about it. In my first video about Stefan, I included a clip of him talking about Star Wars and what he sees as its anti-family, anti-male message. Now, the purpose of that clip was to demonstrate what I see as Stefan's anti-woman ideology affecting his approach to art, as well as, to a certain degree, everything else. Um, so the purpose of this video is, in part, to expand on that point. Now, the idea that one's particular worldview colours one's understanding of art is certainly not specific to Stefan. It happens to everyone. You know, I have my own biases and leanings that I bring with me when I watch a movie or read a book or whatever. So I'm not criticising Stefan just for having opinions. And I'm generally a fan of what we'll call unconventional interpretations of art. Um, at the least, I think they're usually fun to think about. I've seen it argued, for instance, that Hamlet is a gay character. And there's certain things in the play one can point to that could be interpreted as supporting this. His rejection of Ophelia, his affection for Horatio, and so on, and as well as certain lines of dialogue here and there. However, one needs to be careful with these sorts of interpretations. It's easy to cross over from speculations to declarations. There's a line between speculating that Hamlet could be gay and declaring Hamlet to be gay. And there's a much bigger line between speculating that Hamlet could be gay and declaring Hamlet to be gay based on the scene where he has sex with Horatio, which doesn't happen. You know, you've started misconstruing the text at that point and you've entered into the realm of just being objectively wrong about things. And I mention this now because Stefan makes a few claims about the characters and events of The Force Awakens that I think go beyond individual interpretation and end up just being directly contradicted by the movie. So that's my aim with this video. I'm going to highlight the times I think Stefan is incorrect and present a counter-interpretation of the material. But before we talk about The Force Awakens directly, uh, we'll start with a few thoughts on the fantasy genre. In most epic stories, parents are conveniently removed from the home, allowing the young hero to easily slide under the tutelage of a warrior master and learn the ways of obedience and drama and war. In the original Star Wars, family life was portrayed as mundane and humiliating as a young Luke Skywalker was expected to work productively on his uncle's farm. Historically, epics tend to be fantasies that feed the murder lust of the young who were needed by the aristocracy to wage war on their behalf. The word adventure basically means learn the dehumanizing joy of murdering for your masters. In these stories, boring parents are replaced by wise hypnotic elders who teach young men and now young women the excitement and joys of war. This conveniently allows the authority of the state to displace the authority of parents, transitioning young men from pimply-faced teens to hardened warriors serving their economic and political masters. Hey, who wants to work for a banker when you can kill for a banker? So Stefan starts out with something that I agree with here. He is correct that the fantasy genre usually takes the protagonist's parents out of the picture, either before the story or during the opening act. But he claims this is down to some anti-family and or pro-violence message. You know, freed from their family constraints, the protagonist can now go off killing people under the guidance of an older warrior. And I can't really agree with that interpretation. I think the real reason is mainly just narrative in nature. You know, removing the parents is often a necessary step to force the protagonist into action. If Luke, for instance, had stayed on the farm and not followed Obi-Wan, he wouldn't have a story. Nobody wants to watch Luke work a boring farm job for two hours. Regardless, I think Star Wars is the wrong series to make this point about, to be honest. Neither of Luke's masters, Obi-Wan or Yoda, teach Luke to attack anyone. In fact, they seem to prefer non-violent means of resolving conflicts. You can't win, but there are alternatives to fighting. A Jedi uses the Force 
for knowledge and defense. Never for attack. Obi-Wan sneaks his way past stormtroopers that he could kill, and he even allows himself to be killed. And the culmination of Luke's story has him defeating the Emperor by explicitly refusing to fight. This seems more of an anti-violence message to me, really, rather than a pro-violence one. In the new film, we meet Finn. Now, Finn is a stormtrooper who was cloned, raised without parents, and trained to be a mindless, obedient, killing robot pretty much from birth. As an adult, he has a strong conscience. He is engaging, charming, funny, enthusiastic, and, for obvious reasons, mindlessly horny. In other words, despite being raised in conditions that your average African child soldier would find utterly horrifying, he is a perfectly well-adjusted, mentally healthy, courageous, he's a good team player, he's socially poised, warm and funny. Ugh, this mirrors the fantasy of Harry Potter, who was also endlessly abused as a child and shares most of this eerie, steroid mental health characteristics uh, that Finn has. This Denial of the effects of childhood trauma is the fundamental reason for the consistent re-emergence of intergalactic evil, not just in Star Wars, but in all these stories, and in the world as well. Intergalactic evil? Yikes. What does Stefan know that we don't? So, a few minor points about Finn here. Uh, firstly, Stefan says that he's a clone, uh, but he isn't. I'm a stormtrooper. Like all of them, I was taken from a family I'll never know. Um, secondly, when is Finn mindlessly horny? The Force Awakens is rather sexless, to be honest. The only thing I can think of here is when Finn asks Rey if she has a boyfriend. Uh, but that's about as far as the movie takes that romance, to be honest. He's hardly mindlessly horny. So anyway, the effects of childhood trauma. Why don't fantasy films with orphaned or abused protagonists show the negative effects of such neglect and or abuse? Uh, well, for a start, sometimes they do. You know, I'd argue that The Force Awakens does even, but we'll get to that later. Uh, for now, let's carry on and answer the question anyway, for funsies. So I'd argue that instead of not showing these effects, Fantasy stories like Star Wars and Harry Potter generally do have them, just at a reduced level. You know, it's there, but it's not generally enough to prevent the protagonist from progressing through the story. And the reason why is in the name, really. Fantasy. These works are escapist fiction. You know, they show, at first, average protagonists with mundane lives who are suddenly thrust into some grand adventure. You know, you thought you were just some kid with a horrible family and a boring life. Well, no, it turns out you're actually rich and famous, and you've got magical powers. And yes, it's unrealistic, but it's a fantasy. It's meant to be unrealistic. Nobody wants to watch Harry Potter and the Crippling Anxiety, where we read about a non-magical Harry Potter who tries to work through his abandonment issues. Well, actually, I'm lying. I would totally read that. But anyway, fantasy presents an escape from an often boring and upsetting reality, and I don't think it's a negative escape at all. We need fantasies or we'd all go insane. Now much has been made of the casting of a woman as Rey the new Luke. It is somehow considered to be a break from convention, while her, I don't know, let's just say character, is in fact perfectly boring and predictable, a hyper-empowered, purdy, feminist robot of implausibly infinite abilities. Rey is what by now has become a yawningly cliched stock character, the all-competent ingenue, or the ACI. Now, the ACI starts off as a low-status character, whose endless and escalating waves of superlative competence quickly wash away any and all hints of reality or limitations. A superwoman fetish of automatic and unearned abilities, who ends up as little more than a delusional mangina hymn to bottomless female vanity. <sighs> Ray, this film's ACI, turns out to be fantastic at hand-to-hand -hand combat, flying various spaceships, sword fighting, using the force, CGI cliff climbing, to name just a few. So then, Ray as an all-competent ingenue. 
or to use a less annoying term, Rey as a Mary Sue character. Now I've seen this criticism of The Force Awakens a fair few times and not just from Stefan. So is Rey a Mary Sue character? A Mary Sue here meaning a sort of hyper competent, seemingly perfect character who has extensive and unrealistic skills. Well, to answer that, we first need to answer another question. Uh, what's the line that separates a Mary Sue character and just any protagonist of escapist fantasy fiction? You know, for instance, is Luke Skywalker a Mary Sue? So let's think about this further by running down the list of things that Stefan says Ray is fantastic at. Firstly, hand-to-hand -hand combat. Ray also regularly fights grown men trained from birth in the ways of combat and wins easily. She weighs maybe a little over a buck ten and regularly takes down multiple 200 pound jacked up monster warriors. Uh, but when? There's only one time Rey fights hand to hand in the movie other than the concluding lightsaber duel and that's when she fights these two dudes in the junkyard and if I were being nitpicky here I'd say it's technically not really hand to hand combat because she's armed with a big metal staff. She never fights unarmed in the movie. She's always got a blaster, a staff, or a lightsaber. And have you seen videos of Daisy Ridley's workouts? Now, I have. Purely for research purposes, you understand. And she's hardly a weak person. I mean, I'm over 200 pounds, and I wouldn't want her hitting me in the head with a big metal pole. And let's think about these guys. Like, who are these guys? They're wearing hoods and masks. We don't even know what species they are. We don't even know if they're men, actually. They could be anything under there, for all we know. And they're unarmed. And I think Stefan missed this, but this scene is played as a joke. Finn sees Rey under attack and runs over to help, and halfway there he realises he doesn't have to. Now this scene is giving some information to the audience, you know, Rey knows how to fight with a staff, but there's also some comedy in Finn's unnecessary dash to help. And Finn's surprise that he doesn't need to help out only works as a joke if the audience has an understanding that it is a rare thing for women to be able to defend themselves in the way that Rey can. Anyway, next up, Rey is fantastic at flying spaceships and fixing the Falcon. Rey, on the other hand, has spent her youth picking up garbage, Wally style, but is able to pull off the most ridiculous aerial maneuvers on an unfamiliar spaceship, outflying professional pilots trained from childhood. So, Ray is apparently fantastic at flying various spaceships. Um, now, the only spaceship that Ray flies on screen, if we don't count this little speeder thing, is the Falcon. Now, first off, Stefan says that Ray has never flown a spaceship before. So, you see, boys trained from birth to fight are terrible at fighting. But girls who've never flown a spaceship are immediate experts who can outfly relentlessly trained pilots. Uh, but this is directly contradicted by a line of dialogue in the movie. Not that shooting. Thanks. How did you do that? I don't know. No I've one flown some ships, but I've never no left one? the planet. So Ray has flown ships before, and Stefan says that the Millennium Falcon is an unfamiliar spaceship for Ray. Uh, but I don't know why, because she seems to know a lot about it. Position is down there. This ship hasn't flown in years. Who had it? Duquesne? I stole it from Uncle Plot. He stole it from the Irving boys who stole it from Duquesne. Some moof milker put a compressor on the ignition line. Uncle Plot did. I thought it was a mistake too, but it's too much stress on, on the, the hyperdrive. hyperdrive. You see, Ray works for this guy who she was left with as a child. And he owns the Millennium Falcon, and that's how she knows about it. Now, Stefan goes on to be annoyed about how Ray knows how to fix a problem with the Falcon uh, when Han didn't. When standing with Han Solo at the controls of the Millennium Falcon, Ray fixes a problem that Han Solo cannot even identify. She also goes below deck to repair its malfunctioning innards. I mean, come on! Han Solo flew and maintained the Millennium Falcon for decades! Knew it inside and out! Then this vapid ACI wanders in with no knowledge of the complex spacecraft and knows exactly what to do to fix problems. Uh, but I have a couple of explanations for this. First off, 
Ray is a scavenger who pokes around inside spaceships and strips them for parts, so I guess that would give you some knowledge about the mechanics of how spaceships work. Secondly, the problem with the Falcon is to do with a modification that happened after Han had lost the Falcon. You see, this guy, Ray's boss, made some of his own modifications. So since Ray was there when whatever it was was modified, it stands to reason she'd know more about it than Han and know how to undo it. Additionally here, I remember it being played for a joke in Empire that Han is not exactly a complete authority on how to fix the Falcon. I believe, sir, it says that the power coupling on the negative axis has been polarised. I'm afraid we'll have to replace it. Well, of course I'll have to replace it. Here, Chewie. Uh, I think we better replace the negative power coupling. Also, is Rey fantastic at flying the Falcon? You know, the first thing she does when she takes off is crash it into the ground. And then all of this stuff. And she can't get the shields up. And then the TIE fighters are landing shots on the Falcon. You see, this scene is the scene where the heroes learn to work together. And they barely scrape by. I think the movie's pretty good at showing that Rey and Finn are not that good at flying the Falcon, actually. This is not how a fantastic pilot flies a ship. Why didn't Stefan see any of this? I guess all the feminism got in the way. And there's a comparison to Luke to be made here. Luke is a farmer. Why does he know how to fly an X-Wing? And he seems to know all the controls and can identify problems with the ship. R2, that, that stabilizer's broken loose again. See if you can't lock it down. You know, why is Stefan seemingly more willing to accept Luke as a skilled pilot and not Ray? There's a similar amount of evidence for each. Early on we see them looking into the distance, dreaming of bigger things. They play with something that lets the audience know they want to be a pilot. There's a line of dialogue that lets the audience know they can fly. We need a pilot! We've got one! You bet I could. I'm not such a bad pilot myself. We don't have to sit here. And that's about it. There's even a disbelieving line from Han about their piloting abilities. But who's gonna fly it, kid? You? Where's the pilot? I'm the pilot! You? Luke and Rey are very similar in this regard. If we accept Luke as a pilot, we have to accept Rey as well. Next up, sword fighting. It is nowhere explained how Rey gains her miraculous abilities to take on a master swordsman. Sword fighting is a pretty difficult and dangerous skill to acquire, as I remember from playing Macbeth. Rey simply has the skill, incredibly engages in combat against a master. Swordsman. This is beyond ridiculous, and it is not a message I want my daughter to see. So, sword fighting. Rey shouldn't be a match for Kylo Ren, who is a stronger force user and trained with a lightsaber. And here's the thing, she isn't really a match for him. The odds have to be evened first in order to give her a shot. Now, Stefan doesn't mention it here, but Kylo Ren has just killed his father, so he's emotionally all messed up. And he's been shot in the gut with a weapon that the movie has went out of its way to make seem extremely powerful. Hey. Kylo is bleeding out and he's punching himself in his wound and he's just fought another lightsaber fight during which he was hit with a lightsaber. Also, he's not trying to kill Rey either. He just wants to turn her to the dark side. You need a teacher! I could show you the ways of the Force! And despite all of these disadvantages, Kylo is still the dominant fighter throughout the duel. Rey is running away from him for most of it, and I think this fight is great here actually. There's some excellent acting throughout it. Both Finn and Rey look genuinely scared of being hit by a lightsaber. And it's clear just from the fight choreography who the superior fighter is. Rey only wins because she remembers to use the Force in the end, which mirrors Luke using the Force at the end of A New Hope. So Rey isn't a fantastic sword fighter really, she only barely squeaks out a win over an emotionally distraught opponent who's bleeding out with multiple injuries. But let's talk about her Force abilities. Compare this 
effortless estrogen excellence to Luke Skywalker's slow grind to mastery. Luke had to work for three long films to even begin mastering the Force, apprenticing at the gnarled feet of Yoda for months at a time. Rey, on the other hand, she's a woman, see, she merely has to frown for five or ten seconds in order to master the Force. Now, Stefan's problem here is that he's comparing Rey's character arc over one film to Luke's character arc over three films. You know, the new trilogy is only a third complete, remember? And... Given that Rey meets Luke at the end of The Force Awakens, I'm guessing she's gonna be training with him in the next film, like Luke trained with Yoda in Empire. Stefan should really be making comparisons to Luke's story in A New Hope. Luke had no extensive training in that film, he just got shot by a little shooty ball thing for a while, and he successfully uses the Force in that movie to make the killing shot on the Death Star. And I'd like to make a point here, actually. What does Rey actually accomplish during the end of The Force Awakens? You know, Luke Skywalker starts the movie as a farm boy and ends it by almost single-handedly destroying the Death Star and saving the entire rebellion. Rey has no effect on the destruction of Starkiller Base. That's all Han, Chewie, and Poe Dameron. All she does is defeat Kylo Ren. But the planet's already collapsing at that point, so it doesn't really affect much, really. Luke's untrained use of the Force is much more impactful than Rey's is. Also, the Force is a magical power. One can't really make declarations about whether or not a character would be able to use magic as proficiently as they do in a work of fiction, because it's inherently unrealistic. We can only judge by the movie universe's internal rules. So, have any other characters in Star Wars been seen to use the Force without extensive training? Well, for starters, Anakin in Episode 1. He has special powers. Yes. He can see things before they happen. That's why he appears to have such quick reflexes. It's a Jedi trait. Now, someone might argue that this is because Anakin is exceptionally strong with the Force by birth because of some prophecy or whatever. But this raises a point. We don't know who Rey is yet. We don't know who her parents are, you know, maybe she was hidden on Jakku because of her incredible force potential or something. We don't know. We'll have to wait until the other movies come out to learn more. Here's another important point. Given the endless hyper-competence of modern women in movie and video game combat, how could women ever be the victims of physical violence in real life? Two strong soldiers get their asses kicked by Rey. In the movie Salt, Angelina Jolie regularly throws her 95-pound stick-figure combat moves at giant neck-bearded men beating them handily. Since this is all accepted as valid and empowering, how could there possibly be any such thing as rape culture? Or a patriarchy, for that matter? If women are victims, they must be weaker. But if they are weaker, they obviously cannot take on men twice their size and weight. Which is it, ladies? If you're victims, you cannot be fighters. If you're fighters, then you cannot be victims. And isn't it dangerous to endlessly encourage women to fight men twice their size? Why do women ever even bother calling the cops? Well, because it's just a movie, Stefan. You see, the problem is you are only seeing Rey as a woman and taking her to be representative of all women instead of a character in her own right. You know, you're only seeing her gender. Just because a female movie character has a special skill doesn't mean that movie makers are saying all women have those skills. This is honestly a very silly argument that I think is below Stefan's usual standard, because it can so easily be reversed, you know. I don't see Stefan complaining about male characters' ability to fight, so why do men ever call the police? Why would men ever need help since we can all apparently fight like Arnie or Rocky in the movies, you know? Silly argument. Now, little has been made of an even more hardcore female hypocrisy in the movie. Finn, terrified of the monstrous intergalactic death cult that raised him to pretty much kill anyone not wearing a Teflon mask, wants to run away and hide on distant planets. Ray roundly condemns Finn for his cowardice, making that scornful World War I lemon-white feather face that indicates a complete denial of egg accessibility. However, shortly afterwards, Ray has an unpleasant vision 
and runs away, saying she wants to have nothing to do with fighting or the war or anything. In other words, Ray has nothing but contempt for Finn's fear of those who destroyed his childhood and have the power to destroy entire planets, while her fear of a bad dream is portrayed as perfectly legitimate. Hmm. Hey, if I said you had a choice to go to war or have a bad dream, which would you take? It is only the modern Western cult of women are wonderful that blinds us to this bottomless hypocrisy. So let's talk about Finn and Ray's attempts to run away. Now, Stefan seems to think that the movie presents Finn's desire to run away as cowardly and Ray's desire to run away as completely rational, but I've no idea where he's getting that from, to be honest. The movie presents both cases fairly neutrally, I think. It shows two characters running away, though one is determined and considered and the other is panicked and overwhelmed. And the other characters all have opinions about that, but that's all. The movie itself makes no moral declarations about who's right or wrong. Ray just panics and runs away, and there's no judgement of that action. It's just what she does. Stefan is doing a special kind of expectant projecting here. He's not projecting his own opinions onto the movie. He's projecting an opinion he disagrees with onto the movie in order to disagree with it. I think the movie's siding with the woman over the man. How awful. I'm going to disagree with that anti-male bias. You know, it's absurd. Anyway, remember earlier when Stefan said that the movies show no negative effects of childhood trauma? Well, here it is, Stefan. Ray is so fixated on her past and returning to Jakku that when Maz tells her what she already knows, that her family are never coming back for her, she panics and flees. She's paralysed by her past and she can't move forward and accept the future. She can't let go of her childhood trauma of being abandoned. And we can say the same thing about Finn wanting to flee. He's been so traumatised by the First Order that he wants to run away rather than face them again. And what about Kylo Ren? You know, his whole thing is being emotionally traumatised. This, Stefan, is exactly what you were asking for earlier, but you missed it because you were fixated on an imagined anti-male bias. Women are not wonderful. They are people. Anything else is sexism. Excessive praise arises from the same bigotry matrix as excessive criticism. Yes, pay attention, black people. Now, I don't really have much to say about this. I include it here only to ask what it means. You know, at what point was Stefan making there? I genuinely can't figure it out. Um, answers in the comments, please. And let us institute a test of movie masculinity called the Ball Crush Test, which goes like this. Do men and women die in equal proportions? If not, is this not virulently anti-male sexism? Are there equal numbers of male and female villains? I'm guessing not. Ah, if there are female villains, is their villainy explained in a sympathetic backstory? <clears throat> Maleficent. Do male villains get the same sympathetic bad stories. When male villains are killed, is their death more brutal than female villains? If male villains target women, are they depicted as more evil than the male villains who target men? Do women sacrifice themselves to save men, at least to the degree that men sacrifice themselves to save women? If these standards are not met, you're not watching a movie, you are watching anti-male war propaganda. Because it dehumanizes and objectifies men, let us deploy the ancient saying that the beginning of wisdom is to call things by their proper names. This is not art. This is warnography. And that's my favourite part of every Stefan video right there, the last five seconds where he stares right at you with the intensity of a man trying to make your head explode using only his mind. So I want to address one part specifically here from Stefan's so-called ball crush test. 
and it's when he asks if male villains get sympathetic backstories like, for instance, Maleficent. And again, this movie is entirely the wrong movie to make that point about, since yes, here, Kylo Ren is presented sympathetically. Kylo is my favourite character in the movie, honestly. I think it's incredibly clever to make him an angsty and unstable Vader fanboy. You know, he's a Vader copycat, obviously, but it's justified by his character, and I really appreciate that. But yeah, Kylo is not a moustache-twirling villain. He's an interesting guy, really, and he's got a surprising amount of depth and complexity, relative to the usual level of depth in Star Wars villains, anyway. So I'd like to wrap up here with perhaps Stefan's weirdest point. And I didn't really understand this one, I don't think, so have a listen. The resentments against men harbored by abandoned boys and their bitter, clinging single mothers showed up in the all-male evil of the Empire and the endless phallic symbols scattered throughout the movie from Darth Vader's helmet to lightsabers to the insemination sequence of navigating a dangerous trench to drop a tiny sperm into a giant Death Star egg in which birth is destruction. The modern semi-socialist state made necessary by the collapse of Western families, the welfare state is in reality the single mother state, is shown by the giant Death Star egg which has the capacity to destroy entire civilizations as unleashed and state-subsidized female hypergamy has repeatedly done throughout human history. Now this is kind of a weird take, and I don't really know what to make of it, you know, the Death Star as the welfare state? It seems like a contradiction of what Stefan says prior to that about the all-male empire representing a hatred of men. So the empire are all male because abandoned boys and single mothers harbour resentments against men? So men have to be the bad guys, uh, but the evil men built the welfare state, the Death Star, and they're using its power of unleashed female hypergamy to destroy civilizations. Did I get that right? I honestly have no idea. Either way, and I'm sorry to say, I really am, but this comparison is really just very silly. You know, to look at the Death Star and say, yeah, well that thing is clearly bad and evil, so it therefore must represent the things that I don't like in real life, such as the welfare state and women. It's such a, it's a laughably direct comparison to draw. You see that, the, the bad thing is blowing up the planet. Well, that's bad. And if you think about it, that's basically what women do, isn't it? You know, it's kind of like what women do, that is. Uh, with the welfare state, they blow up the planet with their hypergamy. <laughs> Nonsense. Thanks a lot for watching. Sorry to go back to the well with Stefan so quickly, especially with so many other channels to get to, but I couldn't stop thinking about him, to be honest. It's those eyes. I get lost in them. Um, remember to like and subscribe. Well, if you liked it anyway. And there's a donation link on the YouTube banner there, so maybe click it for a complete laugh, you absolute madman, you. And stay tuned for more rubbish.